Thank you very much for clicking on this video. This is a review of SS1 Chemistry for Times work for St. Pimpas College in preparation for the student examination that is going to be happening in a week time. So the student need to be prepared. And uh, I have this little way of contributing to the revision. So if you are a Catholic student in Lagos, this is also going to help you a lot. So I urge you to pay good attention as we go over here. These are the topics that I'm going to be looking into. I'm going to use questions and answer to uh, work with it. But it's not all of them. It's not all of them that I'm going to give you the answer. Some of them, I will allow you to think for yourself. So you just need to follow me as we go. Let's start with introduction to chemistry. Uh, when we started chemistry, we started by defining what chemistry is all about. I know your teacher might have given you so many definitions of chemistry. So according to me, chemistry is a branch of pure and physical science that deals with matter. Its composition, structure, properties, uh, changes matter undergoes, and the principle governing the changes matter undergoes and the uses of matter. This is a way I prefer to be used in defining chemistry because this go cut across everything about matter, which is one of the topic here, nature of matter. So are you able to give mention careers that have been tied to under in tied to chemistry under something like teaching services or manufacturing industries uh, petrochemical industry health services can you be able to mention at least two to four careers that have been tied to it okay and the bonus question i have here is what do you understand by the word a chemist someone that studied chemistry or someone that practiced chemistry after studying it so that is whom we prefer to be a chemist so we go a little bit faster let's look at uh the following in chemistry laboratory what they are, i think they're supposed to ask us much here is to define chemistry laboratory and i also believe they can also ask us something like laboratory apparatus and also believe that it is possible for them to ask us to mention apparatus that can be used in a specific known uh uh, uh experiments something like infiltration distillation and titration oh you can find that by your cell also can you be able to give uses of the following apparatus conical flask pipette strong button flask and many more of them we look into this while we were having our classes when we started make two diagrams of apparatus that can be used in filtration distillation titration okay apparatus that can be used in filtration include something like beaker Although majorly in the presence of conical flasks, beaker shouldn't be used. So we have conical flasks, we have beaker, we have a uh, filter funnel, and we have filter paper. For distillation, we can use distillation flasks. Uh, we can use a uh, Leipzig condenser. We can use a uh, retort stand, tripod stand, wire gauze, and Bunsen burner. So these are the things we can use during uh, distillation processes. What about titration? In titration, this is mostly what we do in wire. Uh, we do that in NECO, in GC. This is uh, what we do in order to identify a uh, concentration of another substance. So in titration, we make use of the retort stand with clamp. We make use of um, we make use of the conical flax. We make use of uh, the burette. We make use of the pipette. And we make use of the ties. And we make use of the filter. So it's also possible for you to learn how to draw those apparatus that I just mention them. A bonus question for this is what is the difference between separating funnel and filter funnel? So the separating funnel is an apparatus that is used in separating immiscible liquid, whereas filter funnel is used in separating insoluble solid. I hope you get me on that. This is the best way or the shortest way of differentiating separating funnel and filter funnel. Let's look at nature of matter. When we say nature of matter, we're looking at the composition the structure, the properties, and uh, the changes matter undergoes. In the composition, we look at element, compound, and mixture. In the structure, we look at solid, liquid, and gas. In the properties, we have physical and chemical properties. And in the changes, we look into chemical and physical changes. So let's look at this. What can actually make a substance to be called an element? An element is a substance that has all its atoms having the same atomic number. And it is not easily separated to any different substances. So it is it is impossible to separate an element to different substances. But a compound is a substance that has more than one kind of atoms. 
and we can actually separate this substance by chemical means, but we cannot be able to separate them by physical means because the atoms are joined together in a chemical bond. What about uh, a mixture? A mixture is a substance that is made up of more than one kind of atom, but they are physically combined. And we can separate them using physical means because they are only physically combined with one another. That is this component of mixture can be separated using physical means to different things. So let's go a solid. When we look into solid, that is where we go towards the structure, where we are trying to look at how does the particulate uh, uh, arrangement of substance make them to appear in our physical form. So a solid is a substance that its melting point is above the room temperature. When we ask, what about uh, a liquid? A liquid is a substance that its melting point is below the room temperature, but its boiling point is above the room temperature. What about a gas? A gas is a substance that its boiling point is below the room temperature. If you noticed, the word an element, a compound, a mixture, I use atom to define them. The word a solid, a liquid, or a gas, I use a uh, room temperature. Don't know what are those things that I use in defining them. An atom is the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction. A, when we use that, you need to understand that there's still difference between atom and molecule. We are going to discuss that when we come over to particulate nature of matter. What about room temperature that I use in solid, liquid, and gas? A, a room temperature is the temperature of the room where experiment is being conducted if there is no external source. Although in chemistry, we put it in this way, it is 25 degrees Celsius. So we go with this idea of what a room temperature is. Can you be able to differentiate between an element and a compound? Can you be able to differentiate between physical and chemical properties? For physical and chemical properties, what we do here is that the physical properties are those features or characteristics that we can identify without changing the chemical composition of that particular substance. For chemical properties, we are able to identify the substance by changing the chemical composition of that substance. So what about physical and chemical changes? A physical change is a type of change in which the identity of the substance was not altered or is not altered. What we say chemical change is a type of change where the identity of the substance, which is the chemical composition of that substance, is now altered. That is what we mean by chemical changes. So sometimes I even have a question that I can ask in this form. Why is it that uh, we know that chemical changes are mostly like permanent or irreversible? Or then why is it that when you cut wood into pieces and we cannot reverse it by putting it back, yet it is rendered as a physical change? And the answer is just that the identity of that substance was not altered. A bonus question. Can you classify the following into element compound mixtures using a table? Let me give you just a simple way to get it. Oxygen, sulfur, gold, bromine, and diamond are elements. Chalk, water, carbohydrate, common salts, urea are compound. Then the rest are rendered as mixtures. So be careful with what you see. So what about uh, this picture you are viewing here? If you look at this picture, the picture is portraying some circles, and each of the circles represents an atom. What we are to use this in order to answer this question that are peeping at us. The two circles in A means that there are two atoms bonded together, and that two atoms are of the same kind. That means that they are the same element. But if you look at B, we have two atoms. One is big, black, and the other one is small. There are two atoms. They bonded together. So the bonding means that they are chemically bonded. But the one that you do not see joining together, they are not chemically what bonded. Then can we use this idea to answer the question that we are seeing? Which of the diagram, which of the diagrams perfectly represents argon as an element in its physical form? So if you look at the word argon, the word argon is a noble gas. So that means that we should have the idea that this element is a gas. So the best way to look for this is to look for where are we going to see a gaseous representative? D has the answer. C has the answer. A partially has the answer and E has the answer. But the problem here is that an argon gas 
is a monoatomic and is only D that has the perfect representation. A mixture of an element and a compound only. A mixture of an element and a compound only. So we look for where we're going to see a compound and also going to see an element. So G gives us the correct answer to go for. What about a hydrogen gas molecule? If you look at a hydrogen gas molecule, it is diatomic. When we say diatomic, it means that two atoms are combined together, two same atoms. And A is the best way, best uh, representative of that. A molecule of a solid monoatomic element. For solid, there is only one solid diagram that is there, H. So that represents the answer. A mixture of two rare gases. Two rare gases. Remember, they are all monoatomic. And they are going to be of different color and they are not going to be joining. So C represents the answer. What about this uh, other question, which is are not, I call it a bonus question. It just looks like the same thing, like aluminum as an element in its physical form. No, that aluminum is a solid. So H is the best answer for it. A mixture of two elements only. If you look at these two elements, it means that we are not talking about the same element. If you look over there, it's a mixture. So C is the best answer for this. What about a molecule of a diatomic element? A molecule of a diatomic element. That's an example of hydrogen gas, which is A as the answer. A molecule of a monoatomic element. Here, there is a problem here. Because when we say a monoatomic element, there are two possible answers here. D, which is a gas and H, which is a solid. So two of them can go for it. Okay, the compound NH3. If you look at that word, uh, that's a chemical formula, NH3. It means that N is one of the atoms and hydrogen is appearing three times. So we look for a diagram that has one particular color bonded with different color that is only three. So the best answer for that is B. I would like you to pause this video Try to listen to this again and make sure you understand each words I made use in this place. Okay, look at this. In particular nature of matter, we are looking at the particles that make up matter. Something like atoms, which is the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction. Molecule, which is the smallest particle of a substance that can exist alone and still retain the chemical properties of that element or substance or compound what about the aeon any atom or group of atoms that has a charge we render it as what aeon okay wait the atom we are even talking about the atom is made up of proton electron and neutron the proton is positively charged the electron is negatively charged and neutron is neutral the proton and the neutron are found in the nucleus two of them can be called nuclear listen again Proton and neutron are found in the nucleus, and two of them can become nuclear. We have electron found at the shell, or we can see it in an orbit orbital. So we go with this. We have electron number, we have proton number, we have neutron number, and we have nucleon number. Electron number is the total number of electrons at the shell of an atom. Proton number is the total number of proton in the nucleus of an atom. Neutron number is the total number of neutron in the nucleus of an atom. Nucleon number is the total number of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. So if you look at this, in the nuclear number is the total number of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. And each of these has some special name in chemistry, mostly the proton number and the nuclear number. The proton number is the atomic number. And the nuclear number, nuclear, not neutron, nuclear number is the mass number. And when we want to represent this in a nuclide uh, diagram, we use something in this nature. Like this, consider the atoms A, B, E. The A represents the mass number. The B represents the atomic number. The A, which is the mass number, determines mostly the physical property of an atom or the weight of an atom. And the weight of an atom is a physical property. 
but B determines the chemical property of an atom because that determines the element we are discussing. According to the definition of element, we say that element is a substance that has one kind of atom by proton number. So the E and F, they are different atoms, yet they are the same elements. And two of them are called isotopes. For instance, they can ask you to give two examples of elements that behave like this, this phenomenon. The phenomenon is called isotopy. The existence of this of two or more atoms having the same proton number but different mass number as a result of differences in their neutron. So they can ask you to give example of this. If they ask you to give example of this, uh, we have chlorine. 35 and we have chlorine 37. You can also include oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon as example of this. Now, the question here is, apart from what I have said here, do you think they will have the same physical and chemical properties? Mind you, this question requires your strong ability to understand English language and also understand chemistry. Since the question is asking physical and chemical properties, for physical properties, no. For chemical properties, yes. But if you answer it no, and yes, you failed it. Rather, it should be no and yes, respectively. If you do not use that word respectively, you failed this answer. Can you give an uh, explanation to your responses? According to what I said earlier, the A and C represent the mass number which that means the physical properties and the physical properties means that they are different but the bb represent the atomic number or the proton number which determines the chemical properties so they will have the same chemical properties but they may not have exactly the same physical property of which according to me they don't they will not have the same physical property can you state the following principle governing the feeling of electrons where we did this in when we introduced the four quantum numbers, where we have the principal quantum number, the uh, azimuthal quantum numbers, we also have magnetic quantum numbers, at the same time, the spin quantum numbers. So can you be able to state the principles that are guiding us in this? Alba principle. Alba principle states that while filling electrons into orbitals, start from the lower energy to the higher energy. Hans rule states that while filling electrons into orbitals that are conjoined. We call them degenerated orbitals. Fill them singly before pairing them. He said again for Pauli exclusion principle, there is no two electron in the same atom that can have the same all four quantum numbers. That is what he said. Also, can you be able to name the quantum numbers which defines an electron in an atom? Mind you, this is a corny question. These people do not tell us name the four quantum number. They do not want to. They do not want to tell us that it is going to be four quantum numbers. They just say define name the word quantum numbers. Actually, what they are asking us here is to name the four quantum numbers. One principal quantum number. Two subsidiary or azimuthal quantum number. Three magnetic or angular quantum number. Four spin quantum number. Okay, now state which of the quantum number is equivalent to Pauli exclusion principle. The one that is very, very equivalent to it is the spin quantum number because that one is the one that makes it clear that it is impossible for two electrons to have the same uh, all four quantum numbers. State the orbital in which the 16th electron of an atom is mostly likely to be found. Be careful. You can only do this if you follow the Hans rule. The 16th electron to be found at P, X, at 3 P, X. Although if you look at it, you look as if it is appearing at 3 P, Z. But be careful on what you are doing. Make sure you follow the Hans rule carefully. So if you follow the Hans rule carefully, you will get it. What if, if it is not 16, what if it is 5? If it's also 5, we can also place it as P orbital. Now, we, when we do the Hans rule, we can know the P orbital it is found. So they can also ask you to sketch the shape of the orbital. If it is S orbital, that, that last, the 16th orbital, uh, the 16th electron entered, you can tell them it's P orbital. 
And here you are going to draw a dumbbell. You know how a dumbbell is supposed to look like. If you don't know, check your notebook or you Google a little bit for that. Okay, can you be able to draw a uh, Rutherford and Bose atomic model? You know that in the center of the circle, you are going to have the nucleus where it is only a positively charged that is found there. Whereas at the shell, we are having the negatively charged revolving around the nucleus, just like the planets revolve around the sun. What about electron configuration? Can you be able to do with something like do that of phosphorus, do that of uh, potassium, do that of sulfur, chlorine, carbon, calcium, silicon, sodium? Can you do that? Can you do it using SPDF notation? Can you do it using KLMN? Can you do it by drawing of the shell? And can you do it by using the SPDF box? But before we actually did this course, we actually introduced a man called John Dutton, 1808. That is what I normally call him, John Dutton, 1808. Uh, in his atomic theory, he gave us about five theories and which four is still is being condemned and modified. Can you be able to state that? Can you actually give reason why the modification came to be? So you should know that uh, it's not everything that I'm going to tell you. You should pick up that one and do for yourself. Can you explain briefly the following? Why is it that some elements has their relative atomic masses not to be a whole number? The reason is because of the presence of isotopes in elements. We are the relative atomic mass of an element is the weighted average of the masses of the isotopes of the element. That is the reason why the calculation will end up being mostly as a fraction. Iodine can never be a lipid, despite the lipid used by nurses for wound. You know, if you go to nurse, you will notice that the nurse have something that is purple in color and uh, is lipid, and they normally use it to uh, uh, address, uh, to dress wound. Now, when they use it, normally we call that iodine. But what that thing is, is iodine solution. Iodine cannot be liquid because it is a substance that only moves from solid to gas. It cannot move from solid to liquid. That is why it cannot be liquid. It's among the sublim, uh, sublimation uh, substances. There are only 118 known elements in the periodic table. And each element contains unique atom, according to John Dalton. Yes. There are over 120 unique atoms. Why? So the simple answer is the presence of isotopes in some elements. That's just the simple answer. Because if you look at element definition, I say they will have atoms with the same atomic number. It means that it is possible for them to have different atoms. They may have different atoms, but here, what connects the different atom is just one thing, the proton number. A bonus question here, can you be able to differentiate between an atomic number and mass number? Atomic number is the total number of the proton in the nucleus of an atom, whereas mass number is the total number of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. Some people define it as the summation mass of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. Where is it located? If, for instance, you want to represent it in the uh, periodic table, where can we look at it? If you go back to this video where I did that of isotopes, you will get the answer perfectly. Look at uh, this uh, table. Here, the interest is can you be able to identify atomic number of some elements like nitrogen, fluorine, argon, and uh, can you be able to find out the element that is present that has the atomic number 14? For this is silicon. Can you be able to do the SPDF notation of these elements? Can you find the KLM notation? Can you go for the valence electron? Can you be able to find out the valence electron? If you're my student, if you're my student and you don't know atomic number of the first 20 elements, and you don't know how to write electron configuration, you don't know how to get the valence electron, you don't know how to get the charge, and you don't know how to get the valency, this is my five cardinal point. That means that you are not qualified to be my student. A bonus question here goes back to uh, the isotopes idea. They say consider the two natural occurring isotopes, 3517, 3717, and their relative abundance of 70.5% and 29.5% respectively. That means that 70 goes to 35 and 29 goes to 37. Using calculation, determine the relative atomic mass of element Q. What are we going to do here? This 35 times 70, this 37 times 29, 
If you join it together and divide it by 100, whatever it gives you is the correct answer. So it is also possible for them to change this value. They can use 75, 25. It is also possible for them not even to give you the percentage and they give the relative atomic mass and also give you just 35 and 37 to do that work. It depends on what the person wants to give you in exam. But if I were you, just practice this very, very well. Interchange the number to something like 75 and 25 for yourself and for your own good. Can you be able to draw the evaporation setup with labeling? Because if you can be able to do it in your practical test, you might be able to answer some of the questions. What about the separating funnel? Can you be able to do it? Can you do the filtration? Can you be able to label it properly? And sublimation setup, can you be able to do it? Okay, what do you even think that we would do to evaporation in order to make it to become a sublimation setup? Just add what? Inverted funnel and a cotton board. If you just add these two, it becomes a sublimation because that inverted funnel is what we use to collect the, uh, the uh, sublimate. That's what we're going to use to collect it. Okay, do you know the physical properties that we can use or we can consider when we are separating mixtures using the following uh, techniques? Look at this, simple distillation. What do we use? What is the physical property we are looking at? Sieving, what's the physical property? Filtration, what are we looking at? Check your notebook, you will have the answer clearly written for you. Crystallization, do you have it? Decantation, evaporation. Can you be able to set the physical properties I will be looking at for me to be able to separate substance using this method? That is what the question is all about. This is a sample of the separating funnel. If you notice very, very well, I have set this separating funnel three times if I were you as a student. Something that is being emphasized by a teacher tells you that that thing is very, very important mostly in your exam look at this how will you separate a mixture of ammonium chloride potassium chloride lead to chloride in the laboratory if you notice all of them are chlorides but there is something here there's something important here ammonium chloride when you heat it it will sublime potassium chloride when you Add water to it, it will dissolve. Lead two chloride will not dissolve in water. So we are going to use the, their own physical property to separate them. Heat the mixture. Don't add water yet. Heat the mixture. Ammonium chloride will sublimate. So we are going to take uh, the filter paper to collect the sublimate of ammonium chloride. Then it will remain potassium chloride and lead two chloride. Potassium chloride, lead two chloride. Add water to it. We call it dissolution when you add water to it potassium chloride will dissolve in water whereas lead two chloride will not dissolve in water so the filtrate is the potassium chloride we are going to evaporate the filtrate in order to recover our potassium chloride whereas the lead two chloride will be our residue that residue we are going to expose it to the sun and it will get dry and will recover our lead to chloride. That is a simple way of doing that in the laboratory. Can you give one use for each of the following laboratory apparatus? You notice I have said something about this laboratory apparatus in the beginning, and I'm repeating it here again. Desiccator, use it to dry substance. Volumetric flask, what do we normally use volumetric flask to do? We normally use it to prepare reagents for volumetric analysis or quantitative analysis. We have two types of uh, an analytical chemistry, we have quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative has to do with the amount, amount. So the volumetric analysis is amount in volume. I hope you get me on that. Okay, glass rod. When we say glass rod, what we use it for is for staring. You don't use it to hit somebody, please. You use it for staring. I know your mind will be, uh, let's use it and hit somebody. Okay, let's look at this. Let's look at, find the oxidation state of sulfur. I know my students might not do much well here because we do not have much time to dwell on this. So I will just allow us to look into this. Let's start with SO2. We are looking for oxidation state of sulfur. In our world, in our school, what we take as this oxidation state is the charge of sulfur in the compound SO2. Here we know that the O2, we take it as the homeowner or the home maker that is the compound home maker or oh, we call it oxides oxides 
oxide means that anything that oxide is there, that is oxide. So S, let's go with this. Finding the oxidation state of uh, sulfur in SO2. Remember that there is no sign in that SO2. Like that SO3, there is a sign, but in SO2, no sign. So it is neutral. We know that O is the home maker. So we are taking reference to O. If we do electron configuration of O, valence electron and the charge, we are going to find out that O is minus two. So we are going to use the O is minus two in this work. So O, the charge is minus two. But this minus two is appearing two times. So we say two times minus two will give us minus four. S plus two times minus two will give us zero. The reason why we say zero is because it is neutral. That is the charge summation of S and O. O, it should be zero. So we have it as, S minus 4 will give us 0. If we make S the subject formula, S is plus 4. Do it with something like NO2. Find the oxidation state of nitrogen in NO2. Let's go for Na2SO4. Let's try something that looks like that here. So Na2SO4. Since there is no charge in front of it, nowhere, we do not see any sign of negative or positive. So it is neutral. So we are going to sum sodium, sulfur, and oxygen based on their number and including their charges. But sulfur, we don't have this charge of sulfur. The highly electronegative is oxygen and it's appearing four times. Since we know that oxygen, as the last work we did, is minus two. So minus two times four will give us minus eight. Let's go for highly electropositive. Here, the highly electropositive is sodium and it's appearing two times in this compound. And the charge of sodium is plus one. How do we get it? Two, eight, one. Since it can lose this one electron because its valence electron number is below four. So it can lose all its valence electron, which is one. While you are losing one electron, you are plus one. If you lose two electrons, you are plus two. If you lose three electrons, you are plus three. I hope you get me on that. So that is why it is plus one. Then it's appearing two times plus one times two. If you are summing the charges, remember I said the charges should sum together to give us zero. So we're having plus 2 plus S plus minus 8 will give us a, you know where I get the minus 8? That minus 2 times 4 over here. And you know where I get this plus 2 is plus, plus 1 times 2. So if you sum it together, it gives you 0. And S plus 2 minus 8 will give us 0. So we are having S minus 6 to be 0 and S to be plus 2. What about the SO32 minus? This SO32 minus has a sign. So the sign is 2. Minus. So we are going to say we are going to equate the charges together to be equal to minus two. So we have something like this. There is a charge here, as I said earlier. Oxygen is the highly electronegative because it is seen at the right hand side. It's the highly electronegative and it's appearing three times here. And each charge is minus two. Minus two times three will give us minus six. So S plus minus six equal to minus two, which is the charge. I hope you get me on that. Okay, so we go S minus 6 is equal to minus 2. So who will be this X? S is equal to minus 2. And this minus 6 goes to the other side, become plus. It gives us minus 2 plus this, which is plus 4. So S here, the oxidation state of S, which is sulfur, is actually what? Plus 4. What about naming of compound? Na2Cr2O7 is named as sodium. Hepta oxo dichromate cis. You may ask, how did we come to be? Sodium here is plus one, is appearing two times and is in group one. So anyone that is group one, group two, group three, we don't state the oxidation state. And the oxygen that are present there is seven oxygen. We call it hept. The oxygen changes its name to oxo. So we call it hepta oxo. The chromium changes its name to chromium because it is attaching to someone. Here it is oxygen. It's attaching to the highly electronegative. The highly electronegative here is oxygen. So and it's appearing two times. We say it's dichromate. So we call it sodium hepta oxo dichromate cis. We name the first the highly electropositive, which is the Na, followed by the highly electronegative, then the center atom, which is the Cr2. CuCl2 is called copper two chloride. MnO four minus be careful mn is manganese now when it is serving as a center atom as it's serving as here we call it manganese but we don't start 
Nemi Mangani, we start from the O4 because this sign is telling us that this is supposed to be a ternary compound, but we have lost a part of the ternary compound, which is a positive sign. So from this idea, we are going to go with this, that this is tetra oxomanganate 7. If you do the finding the oxidation state of ML, you get the answer to the 7. So you can be able to get that. Can you be able to write the chemical formula for the following? Something like copper 2 chloride, which is already up here. So look at it, how we got it. The highly electronegative chloride valency is 1. The highly electropositive, which is copper, valency here is 2 because they say it's copper 2. And the, that means that the charge is going to be plus 2. That is, oxidation state is plus 2. So the charge here in this compound is plus 2. And being plus 2, if we convert the plus 2 to valence, it's going to be 2. That is where we have valency to be 2 here. So we have Cu2, Cl1 by crisscross. If you use crisscross now, the 1 from the clean, that is from the chloride, will go to the copper. Whereas the 2 from the copper will go to the chloride. We have something in this nature. That's the correct answer. What about ammonium trihydrocarbonate? The word ammonium is already known to be something of NH4. Uh, so the triozo nitrate, triozo nitrate means three oxygen and there is a single nitrogen. So if you join it together, we are going to have it as uh, NO3. But the nitrate, which is the nitrogen, they say the charge is five. So if we do a little work on five plus minus six, because each O is minus two. 5 plus minus 6 is going to be what? Minus 1. So the valency of NO3 is minus 1. The valency of NH4 is plus 1. The, the charge of NO3 is minus 1. So the valency is 1. And the charge of ammonium ion is plus 1. But the valency is 1. So they have a 4 value. So we are going to have by crisscross, 1 go to here, 1 go to here. It doesn't have any change. We have NH4, NO3. What about this hepta ozodichromate cis ion? Can we be able to get this? Here, the highly electronegative is oxygen and the charge is minus two and it's appearing seven times. So we call it hepta. That is, that seven is coming from the word hepta. The middle atom, which is actually the center atom, is chromium and it's appearing two times. And the charge is cis. If you look at that hepta ozodichromate cis ion, look more like the sodium. Hepta ozodichromate. Yes, it's the same place we get it. Hope you get me on that. Okay. So two times, it's appearing two times, and each of them is charge C. So two times is going to give us six. If we are combining the CR2 and O7, because they are two negatively, they are going to join together to form negatively charged. So we're going to have CR2O7. But the charge of CR is C and it's appearing two times. So two times six will give us 12, positive 12. But the charge of Oxygen here is minus 1. Since it is minus 1, multiply it by 7, we have minus 14. So plus 12 minus 14 will give us minus 2. So the charge of hepta ozodichromate cis ion is going to be minus 2. I hope you get me on this. Thank you very much for watching this video to this extent. I am very, very happy to have you to this point. And please, if you still have any question, you can write it on the comments and I will help you to get the answer properly. Don't forget to click the like, comment, share the video for others to see. It will help someone and you don't know who you are going to help from sharing this revision. Despite the fact is for the Lagos Catholic Archdiocese students. Yes, it can be used for any students. Thank you very much for watching to this extent.